When Paris Hilton premiered her bio documentary, This Is Paris, in September last year, people were probably not expecting it to have the social impact that it did. It showed that not everything in her life was made easy by her wealth and privilege. The truth is that during her teenage years, Paris went through some horrible experiences that ended up traumatizing her and affecting almost every single aspect of her adult life. The worst of those experiences was the 11 months she spent at Provo, a residential psychiatric facility for troubled teenagers. But what really happened to Paris at Provo? What are those horrific experiences that she went through at the facility that ended up affecting how she experiences trust and love? Keep watching because today I'll tell you the real life tragic story of Paris Hilton and Provo Canyon School. remember that Paris Hilton was a rebellious teenager. Her mother, Kathy, will never forget that phase. Everything that I didn't want her to do, she wanted to do. As young as 16, Paris started hanging out with models and rock stars. She got a very good fake ID and she would constantly escape from her house to go to parties and clubs. She wore wigs, revealing clothes, heavy makeup, and glitter. Paris quickly got the reputation of being Hollywood's party girl. But it's not that this rebellious behavior came out of nowhere. In her documentary, she reveals that it was a natural reaction to how strict her upbringing was. Before she rebelled, Paris was not able to wear makeup, date, or go out with friends. She was encouraged to be well-behaved at all times. Paris's strict household was not the only thing that tormented her. She had a lot of trouble socializing at school, and other kids were mean to her, so she only found some sort of comfort in the party scene. Paris's drive to party was her way to find out who she was and what her place in the world was, which is a process that every teenager needs. She didn't always make the best decisions, but she felt like she had no other option. Her parents parents were obviously not happy. They tried everything to control Paris's partying, including locking her up in her room, but she always found a way to escape. When they went for a more drastic solution and started sending Paris to all sorts of outdoor emotional growth programs to try to straighten out her attitude, but all of these attempts were unsuccessful. Paris always found a way to convince the other kids to run away with her. So at this point, Paris's parents had no idea what to do with her. They thought the only thing that could possibly help them was finding a stricter program. And they found one. I thought I was being I started screaming for my mom and dad, like, help me. No one would tell me what was happening. The aggressive way in which she was taken in the middle of the night to Provo was only a glimpse of the 11 months long nightmare that Paris, who was only 17 years old back then, would experience. Provo Canyon School claims to be a residential treatment facility that offers help for teenagers with complex emotional needs. But what really happens behind closed doors is far from helpful. According to Paris, Provo was hell on earth. She recalls how from the moment she woke up until she went to bed, people were screaming in her face. Without even getting a diagnosis, Paris was given pills every single day. They didn't tell her what they were for, but they made her feel tired and numb. Even though she was monitored every waking minute, Paris eventually found a way to not take them. But someone told on her, and a member of the staff soon found out that she had been hiding them. The consequences she had to face for this fault were inhumane. Paris was sent to solitary confinement, where most of her clothes were taken and she had to spend 20 hours there, freezing, starving, alone, and scared. Things didn't get better as the days passed. Paris had no privacy. She was monitored every second of the day, including when she had to use the bathroom or take a shower. She was underage back then, which made the constant monitoring even creepier. I felt like a lot of the people who work there got off on children and seeing them naked. Paris felt violated every single day, and she cried herself to sleep every single night. The members of the staff also said horrible things to her, and they controlled her communication with her family, so she couldn't tell them anything of what was happening in there. All of this went on for 11 months. Paris believes that the goal of the people who worked at Provo was to break the teenagers emotionally. The heiress recalls that the only thing that helped her stay sane was thinking about what she would do when she got out. Her mind started to be fixated on wanting to be successful and independent, so her parents could no longer control her, and she would never experience anything remotely similar to Provo. After Paris turned 18, she was finally released from Provo. She remembers that as one of the happiest moments of her life, but sadly, being released from the facility did not mean that the nightmare was over. Little did she know that her time there would haunt her for the rest of her life. 
I think all my anger just went into my drive for success. Before her documentary, Paris never told her parents anything she had gone through at Provo. She thought she just needed to suppress it and block it out, like many survivors of traumatic experiences. She thought people wouldn't believe her or understand. She wanted to leave it all behind and move on. But that was not an easy task. To this day, Paris has constant nightmares that she's in the middle of the night. And it's not only at night that the experience haunts her. Her time at Provo really made her believe that being hurt was a normal thing. In her documentary, Paris talks to several other survivors of Provo. One of them, Catherine McNamara, points out the most problematic part of Provo clearly and bluntly. Because the lines of like tough love and abuse are so blurred, that it's really easy easy to not see the signs of abuse ahead of time in a relationship. And that's terrible if you think about it. These types of facilities are advertised as something made to help teenagers. When you tell a teenager that they're going to get help and then you subject them to pain and humiliation, it obviously makes things confusing. For this reason, many survivors of Provo, Paris included, had a tough time getting into healthy and loving relationships. After leaving the facility, Paris had no idea of what love was or how to be in a relationship. Even now, she has many problems trusting people and opening up to them. It also took her many years to finally share her story. When she was ready to do it, she found solace in the support of other survivors, and she also helped many other people to start their healing journey. The testimonies of the survivors featured in Paris's documentary are heartbreaking. Elizabeth Martin keeps having nightmares about the place after 20 years. Paris's former roommate, Raina Lissicum, reveals how evil the members of the staff were to her and how they tried to break her. Jessica Pike, Paris's best friend at Provo, said that the facility made her believe that pain and humiliation were the norm, which drove her to unhealthy relationships. Once the documentary was out there and the door was open, people felt more confident to speak up. Tattoo artists, Kate Von D, for example, went to Provo herself, and she said her experience there was the most traumatic six months of her life. Kat was sent there at 15 because she was listening to punk rock music and because of how she was dressed. Once at Provo, she was made to shave her head, and the staff also made her believe that she had contracted HIV, which was not true. Kate had PTSD after Provo, and she believes that the institution is the root of her problems with illegal substances later in her life. Other testimonies from non-celebrities are equally terrible, and after the documentary, they started popping up all over the internet. One person remembers when a staff member rubbed a person's face into the carpet until their entire face was covered in burns. Others were force-fed and deprived of any human contact or conversation for over a month. As these testimonies continued to come out, it became more evident that Provo was not the only institution that focuses on this kind of therapy for troubled kids. Take Turnabout Ranch as an example. After Paris spoke out about Provo, a survivor from Turnabout Ranch named Hannah Archuleta also came forward about her experience in that facility after Dr. Phil sent her there. Hannah gathered enough strength to sue the ranch, and that's what encouraged Danielle Brigoli, aka Bad Baby, to publicly confront Dr. Phil for sending her there as well. The brave testimonies of Paris, Danielle, and all the other survivors are priceless, and they're changing how the laws that regulate these type of institutions are being made, because that's precisely the problem, the lack of regulation. Provo has been functioning for almost 50 years, and even though it gathered a lot of lawsuits and accusations, there was no accountability from the institution until very recently. Former members of the staff have also started their own programs for troubled teenagers, which are considered sister programs of Provo, and often have the same problems that Provo has. After all the media attention that Provo has been getting, they said that they can't comment on anything that happened before 2000, because the school was under different ownership back then. So what, they're just trying to get rid of the responsibility? Oh, heck no. Survivors are working tirelessly to support each other, and they already found testimonies of other people who attended Provo between 2002 and 2006 that were also subjected to inhumane practices. So after Paris became a social warrior and organized a protest to denounce the injustice within the troubled teen industry, what was the next step? the tireless work of Paris and the rest of the survivors had a huge impact. At the beginning of April 2020, a bill targeting troubled teen centers was signed into law that will bring more transparency, accountability, and regulation in all the disciplinary measures that these types of centers implement in their patients. This all comes from the recent testimonies that came up after Paris's documentary. It's a huge achievement. But according to Paris, her ultimate goal is to close down these places because they shouldn't exist and no child should ever have to go through what she went through. Paris is right. What is the actual purpose of those places? Do they really work? Experts think they don't. Oh, there has been research over and over and over again about punishment style treatment 
it does not work in the long term. We know that. These behavioral facilities appear to be more like a quick fix for desperate parents who just don't know what to do with their problematic children. Liz, a survivor from one of these facilities that then became a therapist, has a recommendation for parents of troubled kids. My, my message really is for well-intended parents, if you know your child is struggling and, and you want to find the help that you need, do not make this decision while you are in your crisis. I think we all know that some teenagers can be mean and difficult to deal with for parents, but a facility that hurts, degrades, and humiliates them in every possible way is hardly the best solution for the root cause of their behavior. You can see the proof of that in the testimonies of the survivors. It hurt much more than it helped. What are your thoughts on Paris's story and how she helped to change the law? Let me know in the comments below.